So I'm not from the life science department. Um, so this is the first thing that it could be, it could sound strange that the life science department is a group of researchers that do other things uh, different than the one that I will show you now. Life science department is more related to bioinformatics, uh, genomics and computational biochemistry, but we work in a different, in a different thing. The reason is a bit historically on the, on the, on our own personal histories there. But the fact is that what we do is computational uh, engineering or computational physics. Um, and we work on, what we do is we develop code and software from the very beginning, from the, from the very um, algorithms up to the parallel implementation. And uh, uh, on that end, we can think that biomechanics is one of the most beautiful fields for doing these things because of the, um, the, the, the challenges that these uh, biological systems put on, on us for the, on the simulation point of view. You have seen all through the talks um, how difficult it is, and in particular, maybe the closest talk that you have seen in this um, summer school, the closest to what we do is that of Blanca. And you can see how uh, difficult and challenging it is. It's the closest one because we work also in cardiovascular. I don't know if you have seen this this TV show. It's it's very nice. It's very it's a bit freaky. It's, but well, it's it's good. It's for people that I I realized just five minutes ago that I have this supercomputing whatever. So it's kind of today I I, I get one of these T-shirts and I didn't realize that it says supercomputing or whatever. So you can think what a freaky guy. But well, anyway, um, so in this freaky TV show, uh, there is a, they, they say this, that computers are not the thing, computers are the thing that gets, gets you to the, to the thing. In the sense that computers, to me and to most of the people that are working in the field, computers are not that important. Computers are just the mean for doing interest, interesting things. Well, the mean is too interesting too, but the fact is that we do not um, get distracted in, the, in these beautiful computers, but we try to use them to discover things. In our department, we have these research lines, which are uh, very technical related to computational mechanics. These are kind of the research lines that you can see in any computational mechanics department or group. Um, so you don't see any bio uh, in this, any bio, bio related word you know, in all this. Because what we group things also is in the applications lines that, we, that what we do um, is used. And because the fact is that as we are a supercomputing research center, we have to collaborate with people in order to use these supercomputers and in order to use um, the software that we develop for these computers in different application fields. And one of the main fields that we are working is uh, biomechanics. So this is the, the target of my, of my talk today. Although as, as we do other things, but the main application field is biomechanics. Uh, so in general, the projects we are, where we are involved in are these kind of projects where you have complexity. And this complexity can come through different aspects of the, of the system that you want to simulate. Um, and but f the, on the end, what we look for is to develop efficient and accurate software that can run in supercomputers, or at least in large, in, in large computers. But most of the problems that we are working with are in this kind. Of course, I'm not saying that. Um, all the problems in biomechanics require large computers. Not at all, absolutely not. But we work for the problems where you really need them. And I'm not saying that all the problems, uh, for instance, of course we solve very small problems in order to try to evaluate what we are doing, but the target is finally to solve complex, complex problems. So what we do, what the, the things that I will show you is uh, that we do simulation tools for biomedical research. We do some biomedical research, of course, but uh, we try to help pe people to use these tools. Um, we mostly work at organ level or tissue level. Um, the problems are, are complex, and the fact is that we target to problems where you really need these uh, large computational resources. So what is the kind of things that, that we do? Well, 
we do computational mechanics. I am, I am a physicist, I'm not a bioengineer. Um, I, I hardly know biological stuff just for the, that I learn from the people that work with us that really know. So my field is this, computational mechanics. I'm a physicist by, by training and um, what we do is computational mechanics is kind of a, well, it belongs to theoretical physics. Um, it's, uh, it's computational in the sense that it is mechanics, but also but where you use computers in a, in a massive way. Um, and we work in biomechanics. So um, computational biomechanics is, these are the, is biomechanics, but now using computers. So in this very nice uh, book and very seminal book on, on biomechanics, these are some of the quotations that appear there which is mechanics applied to biology, or the second one is, is very beautiful because um, it tries to relate bio, biological structure and function. And this is something that will appear all along this talk. So the goal of, of doing this kind of thing is try, is try to understand the function of, this, uh, of these systems. And also, uh, this is kind of a motivation in this very beautiful paper about um, continuum mechanics of soft tissue you see this very nice quotation that uh, it, it, it comes a definition of biomechanics much more complex and then uh, he, say, he states that, that we have to take into account that what we do has a purpose and the purpose of um, try to looking for the improvement of the human condition. To me, it's, it's also a, a very nice quotation and it, it has plenty of meaning because being a physicist, we get so easily distracted by things because what we do well just when we look at the at the equations and the way to program them they are very beautiful per se so it is very nice to have also um, kind of a higher um, objective if you look at this at, at a normal material not a biological one you see that it has some order and it is more or less like this brick on the other hand biological tissue work more or less like this it's like a team of of wheels that are all of them with a, with a certain common objective, but they are very independent in the way they, they feel, so they, they, in, in the way they act. So they, are, they have some order, but it is not of the same kind of, a, of a engineering material, let's say. So you see these things are kind of the basic stuff that you find in this biological tissue. And the important thing is that finally what you see are emer emergent macrosp macroscop macroscopic properties. So the, the lowest levels have a strong influence in the, in the upper level in how and modulating the function of the, of the biological system. Um, if you look at the organization levels and the scales, you can see that, for instance, I, I was talking about the life science department in my, in my center, and they work mostly in omics. So you can think that more or less looking at these scales, what they do is about seven orders of magnitudes of what we do, that we work with tissue, uh, seven, eight orders of magnitude. So the, the difference between one and the other is really very, very large. Um, but what is interesting of biolog biological stuff is that you have to take into account that the lowest level had a, had a, have a decisive influence. And in a way you have to consider them not not by simulating them, but you have to consider them, you have to understand how they behave, even at the lowest level, in order to do a better, in order to do better models of the, of the upper scales. Um, also, if you look at the, at the organization levels, um, this is more or less where, where we are placed in, at organ level. However, as I said before, not just for the lowest level, but also for the upper level, um, you have to take into account how, which is the influence of these neighboring levels too on both sides to the to the organ to the organ level, um, not just for understanding the properties, but also to try to. Blanca talked yesterday about the danger of using the word validation on what we do, and, and she said evaluate. Not don't use validate, use evaluate or assess or whatever. Um, so. In order to better evaluate what you are doing, it's very important to consider also what is coming from the upper level in the sense of boundary conditions, for instance, and band, uh, boundary conditions or initial conditions or things like that. That is everything that is required to more or less define the system that you are 
working with. Um, so our research path is then, uh, we develop these simulation tools for biomedical research and we work at different, um, we try to cover in a way all the influences of the different level. So we do simulations, at the, so we do this kind of simulations like trying to understand the, the cell models and its emerging mechanics, then continuum mechanics and then this couple multiphysics, which is very typical of these things. So first of all, we do these simple computational experiments to check the models and then use the models on complex geometries. This is more or less the research patch that we, that we have. One goal is that is something that we, well, we kind of sort of concept of this computational man, which is the, or computational human, not man. So the idea is try to do the best possible dummy for biomedical research and then try to adapt it to patients. It is, we have seen many times that uh, the system is so complex that, that, that people really do not understand what's going on. So it is, well, it's maybe, I'm not saying that the other, that another approach is wrong, but I say that we, we do it a bit differently. We try to um, better understand kind of an average person with an average system and then try to adapt it to, to patients. Uh, I, will example, I will put some examples on the soft tissue uh, that can be applied also to, this, is, this would be for um, the mechanical action in soft tissue, but you can think about this uh, also with the electrophysiology or, or blood flow or many things in this, in this regard. So how these tissue cell properties can emerge to upper levels and at what extent this response to the system, to this soft tissue, to this, uh, of this electrophysiology at this organ level of tissue in general can depend on the fine details of the underlying structure. If you think about forces, if you think of a mechanical, of a mechanical system, the response, of forces, uh, the response to, forces, to forces depend upon internal constitution. So it is, it is very interesting at least to try to understand why it's so complex in the case of biological, biological tissue. You can think that soft tissue is more or less like this. You have cells and extracellular matrix. So if you think about from an engineering point of view, this is the first thing that, that you can see and say, oh, it is like a composite. So it is like a matrix uh, where some fibers or a different material and two, both materials are very closely related and, they are, and this tissue is designed in a way to get some properties uh, from the mixture of these two materials. So this is the first idea that we see from an engineering point of view, say, mm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm more or less understanding what's going on here. Uh, but well, when you study each of, when you just take a very brief look at the two components, you start to see the differences. Um, well, typically the cells have the same genetic information, same genotype, but express different genes depending on many things that, that most of the people doesn't know why, don't know why. Um, so this way of behaving, even if they come with all the information, this way of behaving depends upon um, some things like the surroundings and, and, and upon how they were um, created, let's say. On the, it, it becomes on the genetic design of the, of the cell. But then you have this extracellular matrix, which is the one that gives this strength and resilience. So it is kind of, uh, if you think about, well, again, in, from an engineering point of view, it's like carbon fibers and epoxy, things like that. Um, so this extracellular matrix uh, is the one that is given this strength and resilience. It's the more closer, it's kind of closer to what is a, a, an engineering material, material, let's say. However, as you, as you have seen in the talk before about the, the bone, you see how complex it is. Even if you think of this, uh, how complex it is the, the, the material, but also how complex it is to discover the properties of the material. So this extracellular matrix is there for this kind, these kind of things. Now, if you look at, the, at plenty of studies and papers on how, and even in, at yourself, if you look at, your, at, at a mirror, you see how complex it is. It is very heterogeneous. You have seen before in, in, in the talk before even, it is highly heterogeneous. Um, what is uh, interesting is that, it, this is also in the paper by Humphreys, it says that simplicity arises, it looks like simplicity arises fr from complexity because the more complexity you add in the model, the more regular and homogeneous are the properties of the, are the stresses field, for instance, in the, in the tissue, which means that um, if 
you neglect some scales, let's say, fine, it's okay, neglect it, but take into account why you are neglecting and under which, which hypothesis you can neglect, neglect this lower level. It's highly, highly nonlinear. In, in general, it's inelastic and, and it has inelasticity and viscoelasticity. Um, it varies in time, whereas it varies from individual to individual, not, not just through species, but also from individual to, in, to individual. Um, and I said before, it's multi-scale, multi-physics, and strongly co coupled. So to us, to physicists or engineers that works in computational mechanics, um, what I'm saying is these, all these were the reasons for a computational mechanics person to start study this biological stuff because it is so challenging and so beautiful that you just, you just go for it. Now, how this is described at continuum mechanics level? How to include all this complexity? Well, first of all, you can think about levels also. First of all, there is this constitu constitutive relationship. In the, in the case of uh, mechanical deformation is how stresses are related to strains. This is kind of in the core of all your simulations. In, in solid mechanics, there are people that are working on to design this constitutive relationship for all their lives, even without, and, and doing very, very simple simulations and very, very complex experiments to define how this uh, constitutive relationship behave. Um, so these relationships come from the very, very deep structure of matter. Once you have this constitutive relationship, what you can do is to plug this in a differential equation. So this is going to give the space-time evolution. Once you have this, then you plug this and, and give the space-time evolution. This is the thing that um, where starts, computers start to appear. If you look at the, at the um, or large computers start to appear. If you just look at the first part, the first part can be uh, analyzing on a single base, single cell uh, basis. And well, this can be or small pieces of tissue or based on, on guessing some parameters from experiments. But now this is the things start to get more complex even because there with, with this, you, you, you would like to plug this and try to, to plug this uh, constitutive equation in the, in the differential equation and try to study the temporal and spatial be behavior of your system. And finally, it comes up that, okay, but it is not, you don't need only one equation, you need many equations to simulate the full system, all of them coupled. And uh, they, the coupling can be really tight, and also coupling can be just a different problem. Um, it's very controversial, for instance, well, not controversial, but there are plenty of different models for electrophysiology, plenty of different models for um, cardiac mechanics, but there are plenty of different models for the coupling of electrophysiology and cardiac, and, and cardiac uh, mechanics. So it is like you have this local behavior, you have this global behavior, and then you have this system behavior. So what we, tr what we are trying to do is trying to give a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive study of all these things that are coupled together. Um, now, to me, to, to a physicist, the heart is... Um, it's the pump, it's the perfect pump. It's a pump that was created after millions and millions of evolution and is there and it works. It is extremely efficient, uh, extremely resilient. So it is kind of the perfect pump. But in any case, okay, it's uh, perfect, but it is no more than a pump. So it is a physical system. But it is a physical system with a problem, which is again, uh, all the complexity. This, was, this is written in, a, in this uh, Daniel Streeter book so it is, this is a handbook of physiology section. It's like the Grey's Anatomy of, the, of this kind of thing. So it is very, it's an old book. And this sentence was written in 1979, but it is absolutely um, real nowadays. And it, it, it puts us with, the, with, this, with this thing that um, it is not, it is very sophisticated and we can describe it as a physical system, but it, it wasn't designed by an engineer. So this makes that you have to try to understand this in a, in a kind of different way. Um, it is a pump, but it is so complex as, as that. In the books, it looks like this, but in the real, in the real life, it looks like, like this. It is very real because it is myself. That I, was, it was, I volunteered for being one of these uh, machines and well, so there is my heart. So it's, it's to, to see how committed we are in, in the research that we just go through this. 
ugly machines, just to get these images. So if you think about uh, the if you think about the physical system, we can describe more or less like this. You have this electrophysiology that is described with this um, linear and isotropic diffusion plus some very complex uh, nonlinear terms. Um, then the mechanical deformation, it's, uh, we solve it using large deformations. You have nonlinear material models as it is um, finite deformation. It is uh, nonlinear also in the geometrical point of view. Um, Plot flow is, is a navier stokes for incompressible flow. It could be Newtonian or non-Newtonian, but the fact that it's Newtonian or non-Newtonian is, is, is very simple how to program one or the, or the other uh, with respect to all the, the other things. Um, coupling, the coupling between the electrical and mechanical deformation, it's, uh, it's um, it, as I said before, it, it is in green because you can think that it is an, a completely different problem also, very difficult and controversial with plenty of different models. Um, uh, where the calcium is the key in this, in this coupling, and this is done on the volume, that is to say, for each point, uh, you compute this coupling and you compute the stress that is generated by this electrical propagation for each point, and then you have the coupling between the mechanical deformation and the blood flow, which is done through the boundaries. Coupling between the mechanical deformation and the blood flow can have some numerical difficulties, but it is not, there is no physiological model on that. This is just how you, tra you transfer forces. On the other hand, everywhere, in all the rest, there are plenty of physiological hypotheses that you have to admit. So it's a three-coupled problem. In this case, it's, it's, uh, you have these three coupled problems. They are very intimately coupled. So you have this electrophysiology and solid mechanics and blood flow. All of them are transient and dynamic. You can do some approximations at some point of doing some kind of things, depending on, on, on the case that you're solving. You can solve the mechanical as a quasi-static or whatever, but you have to take into account that all of them are transient and dynamic. Um, we use, in general, one single mesh for electrophysiology and solid mechanics. We, we do all, it, this is not, uh, this is what we do. It can be done in a different way, but this is just to give you an idea of what we do. So when you see the next slides, you will have a better idea of the things that we do. Um, and we use one parallel code that is ours to simulate the full problem. It is, what we use is a stagger strategy. So we solve the problem sequentially for each time step. It can be done monolithically. This should be another strategy, but in, the ca in, in our case, it's fine with the st staggered is is okay. So this is staggered, that each multiphysics equation is solved sequentially by blocks at each time step. And then at the end of the, of the time, at the, you have, for each time step, you have a iteration strategy that you can follow in order to couple everything. The, the good point is that on the end, after all these iterations, you can reach, the, you, you can reach a, a situation as if you have solved it monolithically. The downside is that maybe you, you never reach this because it is not stable, it is very difficult to converge, but well, you can do things in order to get this um, improved. Um, so this is, again, as I said before, this is kind of a simplification of the, of the system that you want to solve. But remember the pictures I show you about the tissue, things are much more complex than that. Even like this, it is, well, you can see it's relatively complex, but if you look at this, well, this is much more complex. And we are trying, we are targeting to do something that it is kind of comprehensive and trying to add more and more things to the, to the code, to the um, simulation. This is also another thing that it, that it goes in our ADN, in the one that we are, that my, my group and the people that work with me, um, as we, as we, do multiphysics, we would like to put everything all together and try to solve everything all together. So what we are targeting are things like this. I mean, this complex, very um, multiphysics problem. So this is a very, this is a very large difficulty that nature is not a CAD user. So you are not going to have a CAD from the kind of system that you want to solve. In my, in my group, we do, uh, we use the code for doing several engineering stuff that are very complex too. Uh, but always you have a CAD, um, or at least you can try to have a CAD like this one, or even much more complex problems. See, for instance, this one. This is the city of Barcelona. So this is a CAD of the city of Barcelona, including, well, you can see here the city and then the mountains. You see the Llobregat River there. You see the, the harbor. 
as you see, it is indeed very, very complex, this cut, but it is a cut. So with this cut, you can, you can have a mesh, complex one, but you can have a mesh. It's a lot of work that you have done, and, and finally you can, you can come up with a very large mesh to solve a really complex problem. But at least you, you can have this mesh. It is, can be done. There are plenty of things. I remember one of you in, in the talk asked me something, and I said, I will show, I will show you some meshes. I don't know which of, uh, of you were, but well, this is the mesh of the city. Uh, what it just as a um, side comment, uh, it's about, this mesh is about uh, 50 million elements. It's not that large because it is, the resolution is not that, that small. But in any case, if you have a cut, you can do that. If you have a cut, you can do this also. These are the things that we do. This is a combustion problem in a combustor for um, an aircraft engine. So as you see, it's, it is indeed very complex cut. It is, the geometry is very complex. These are parts of the, different parts of the, of the geometry. This part here, all this is all this, where flow is, flow is getting into. All this part is all this part. So as you see, it's really very complex, but the problem is that you have this. So how do you get, how can you generate a mesh for these kind of things that is moving all the time and, and, and changing and, and whatever? Well, you work a lot on that. We have a mesh generator that it is specifically done for doing this kind of mesh. Look at this beautiful example that we are doing with, with uh, people here in, in like Oscar and, and Costa here in, in UPF and Federica. You have seen one of the posters of this. Look how complex it is. This is the inner part of the, the inner part of the ventricles. So you can have the mesh and you can see this jungle of things that are within the, within the ventricle. So if you would like to solve fluid mechanics within a ventricle, it definitely be very important to have these kind of things. It is like simulating the wind over a city. You don't think that the city is just plain land. You think about the buildings that are there. So you need this kind of structure in order to properly simulate the fluid flow. So you see how complex it is. Um, so if you don't, if, as you don't have the CAD, this means that the mesh generating tools that you use, that you are going to use in your, to prepare the mesh for doing your simulations is not going to be the normal one that is used by engineers. Now, what is this kind of organ multiphysics simulation? What I will going to do is just to give you some brief examples of the things that we do. This is a, a hard, these are two different different cases on the on or uh, to your right you see the typical geometry that is used for just electrophysiology in electrophysiology the typical geometries are uh, they they cut the heart they get the ventricles and and somehow cut the heart because it and get the two ventricles because ventricles are really very uh, kind of they were the first uh, and they are the most important uh, or mm, it is not a very big field, but there are plenty of people doing research on the ventricles, the electrophysiology of the ventricles. One good reason is that it is relatively easier to get the geometry of the ventricles than that of the atria. Uh, so the first thing that has been done was to study electrophysiology back to the 60s, as Blanca said yesterday. Uh, so, well, you can, Blanca showed you yesterday plenty of images of, of that for the electrophysiology. The problem is that if you want to solve also now the mechanics, then these geometries are very bad, these kind of geometries, because the heart, it is not cut. The heart, there are plenty of things up there. So if you, want, if you really want to solve the mechanics and really want to study how the heart behaves, um, then you have to be very careful on the things, even if you don't need them to to simulate, I can talk about uh, later about this geometry, but you need to properly put the boundary conditions, the kind of anchor in the heart, in order to do something that it is closer to this one, not to the other one. If you do these kind of simulations in this incomplete geometry, then you will find some very weird things. Even if the electrophysiology is fine, but the movement of the heart is not, mm, well, it's not that correct. So under this respect, something that we do is we got this, this real, well, real, this closer to real geometry that we have. There are some details that you can say, well, mm, the septum is very thin, things like that. Okay, fine. It is not that real, but it is closer to real than the, than the cut one. So what we did is we get, the, we get this large geometry and we cut it. And, and we do on this geometry, 
simulations for, electro for electromechanic contraction to compare with the one that it, it wasn't cut and try to see what if you want to use a cut geometry, a, a shorter geometry only of the two ventricles, what are the things that you have to take into account uh, in it? So one of the things, this is a very coarse mesh, but in any case, it, it gives a good idea of what's going on. Some of the things that are important are the boundary conditions. If you do electrophysiology, you have boundary conditions that are related, related to electrical potential. But if you, if you do electromechanics, now boundary conditions are of different kind. You have to see, you have to understand how you grab this mechanical, this mechanical system in order to do, to do it properly because it is moving. So in this case, we are studying different um, uh, boundary conditions on the pericardium and on the, on the, well, on the pericardium, trying to see which are the good ones for studying. Also, you can study different ways of, you know, as I said before, these, um, these now incomplete geometries, but are there just to, to give, an, uh, to give a, an example, are colored by the electrical activation. So they are deforming, but they are colored by, all of them are colored by the electrical, electrical propagation. So these are two different waves, uh, two different models for electrical, electrical propagation. One of them is absolutely simple with no physiological meaning. It is just a way of, um, you just create a wave with the, more or less with the shape that you like, that you want. The other one, the second one, is much more physiologically, much more with, with a much deeper physiological meaning. So it is more useful if you want to really study physiological issues. However, you can see that at some respect, both of them are contracting in the same way, but there are some characteristics that are different. But most of all, especially for the, for the entry of this wave, it is more or less the, the same, which is the morale of these kind of studies is that depending on what you want to study, you will use one model or the other on one hand. And on the other hand, it is very good idea to try to see which are the real differences that different models produce and not say, no, this is a bad model. Or if you look in a paper, uh, people talking about one model say, no, no, this is a very bad model. It's very simple. It's too simple. The problems that we are solving there are not simple at all. So it's not good to just a priori, to have some a priori of these kind of things. And this is uh, the one, one of the last uh, things that we are doing. Um, we are, well, there is one brilliant student here that did this simulation. Well, this simulation was done by the, by the full group, but um, in this case, the setup and, and running. So in this case, what is, it is something related to a company called Medtronic, which is a, this is a very, this is a proof of concept. It is not exactly like that, not at all. It's just a proof of concept. So in this case, what you, what you have is the, the ventricle that is con one ventricle that is incomplete because it, it, it ends here which is contracting and expelling the blood flow. So here the blood flow is computers. And within, uh, you have this, that is a, it's a micro, it's a pacemaker. So this is no more than a, than a proof of concept. So in this, in this case, what, 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 we, what they wanted to study is try to see how the stresses are accumulated around this due to the fact that the ventricle is moving, the ventricle is contracting, the blood flow around this micro is acting against the micro and, and moving it. Um, the mesh is, is relatively coarse, but it is just, as, as I said before, as a proof of concept. This is other kind of things that we are using it. It's, by, it's done by Hasmin, which is here also. It's uh, about these um, uh, studies on, that can be helpful to um, pharmaceutical industry in order to see uh, how these uh, anti-arrhythmic drugs can act on the on on people on patients with arrhythmia. So in this case, it is kind of trying to reproduce experimental um, experimental uh, to, to reproduce experiments that are really done on wedges on small pieces of tissue in the heart and trying to do the same using kind of the same protocol that they use to compute to evaluate this and to do these experiments uh, with a big well and and it is this is very nice to try to provide to industry these kind of studies, but also it is very nice for us to try to improve the models that we are using and try to evaluate the models that we are using. Blanca yesterday showed you something that it is closely related to that, but done on a single cell model. In this case, it's this single cell model that it is used on tissue. 
So it, then it was a cell, now it is tissue. So you can use the same models that Blanca show and you can carry on the same studies, but now on, on these pieces, uh, these uh, small pieces of tissue. Um, so as a sort of conclusion, um, Blanca yesterday gave, um, it was, well, this is the good point of being after, of being a later talk, because you can have, you can get ideas from the previous talks. Uh, so, um, she gave a twist to his talk, about, to her talk about uh, what, about problems that we have in this, in this domain. So as most of, of you are students, then it's, uh, it's nice to, for you to, to see it and to foresee what's going, what, what's coming in your, in your life. Um, if you do modeling, if you do computational mechanics, sometimes um, people do not believe that you are doing science. I mean, if you have to develop computational met methods to do something, um, usually the experimental or the medical side is kind of far away of what you do, and the languages are very different, so they don't see any science there. They can be you as skilled uh, people doing technology or doing or programming, skilled programmers, but they don't see the difficulties in everything, in all these kind of things. But not the difficulty, they don't see science there. But there is a very large piece of science in the things that we do. Um, so sometimes it could be a bit ungrateful because you do plenty of things and then you show these kind of things to the, or you discuss these kind of things with the people that have to use it or have to compare the experiments with and, and they say, well, it's not that good. And, and you've been working on that for ages and trying to get the best of it. So sometimes it could be, it's, it's difficult. So, as I said before, it's easier for them to see the science in experiments or theoretical studies that in computational ones. Um, uh, also, you have to take into account that what we are doing in this case is multiphysics. In multiphysics, one plus one is much, much larger than two. So the difficulties are not just as, it is not an addition of the, of the difficulties of each of the, of the problems. Even you can solve properly one problem and the other, but then when you come up to the couple system, no, it is not possible. You are not going to have any, any solution of them. Um, and not just because of the bugs, but also for the, because of the mathematical, the computational, um, the computational setup of, the, of what you're doing. So if you do this tool development, you first suppose that the physiological models are okay. I mean, you don't question about the physiological model. So if you do, if you show something in a conference about, I don't know, the 10 share electrophysiology model, someone can come and say, well, but this is overseas, but uh, fine, okay, excellent. Just give, a good, give me a good model so I can program and analyze in my code. So here the goal is, we first suppose that the physiological model are okay, uh, and then we do all the other things. So we develop the computational model, which is the math, the, phys the, the physics, the programming, visualization, analysis. So this is the price you pay for this comprehensive stuff, is that um, it's under, it's like, this is done under this hypothesis. So under this hypothesis, I do all the rest. So if you believe in the first hypothesis, then I do, then um, just criticize what we are doing on the, at the next level. Visualization is very interesting problem also. This is an example, it's kind of all the visualizations that you, or most of the visualizations that you see here, they look like cartoons, but then they are, the fact is that we have a very nice visualization team that can help us to produce very nice visualization, but most of them are, well, all of them are based on real results. So in this case, this is a respiratory system simulation. So you have all this respiratory system that comes from uh, a geometry from some patients that with some people that work with us in Imperial College. So they gave us this, this geometry, and under this geometry, we uh, simulate incompressible flow with, with particles. So in this case, particles are not done in a, in a this is a not, not, this, not as a post-process step, but done uh, on the fly. So while you simulate, you integrate the trajectories of the particles. Why? Because what you want to study, you, you need a very accurate model for these particles tracking because you would like to study how these particles are um, distributed all along the system. 
how, which is the deposition of the particles, where are, they, where are they going according to their masses, where are they going according to their initial distribution. Um, so that's why, like, like here, so you study the aerosol deposition of, for instance, uh, drugs for asthma for, or for obstructive um, diseases, things like that. So even the visualization is a complex, complex thing. Um, so Blanca talked about yesterday about the, you have to find the biological question. So our goal is to try to help the collaborators that work with us to ask and answer this biological question. So we put ourselves the asking and answering of the computational ones. So if you can do this kind of dual work, then it's fine. And this collaboration work is, is, is fine. So this is the good, the good point of working with people like Blanca, Oscar, Bart, Costa, Jasmine. The good point is that they, to me, eh, this is my personal opinion, they took the very um, ungrateful job of talking with the doctors. So I don't have to talk with the doctors, I prefer to talk to them. <laughs> so it's much better. So they, they take this very uh, the dirty part. So I can be with my, with, we can be with our computers programming and doing these clean things. No, no smell, no stains, no cancer, cancerigen stuff and things like that. So now what was the use given? This is another question that Blanca suggested. What was the use given to these computational models in answering this biological question? How do you use this uh, for doing? So all thanks to data, all the experiments are extremely, of course, you need to do these experiments. They are very difficult, plenty of science, but then to this computational science. So this is a real multidisciplinary field. Um, so, what is interesting is that, as I said in one of the previous slides, it's a, pra it's a price to pay. It's uh, very beautiful, but the problem is that, and in general, people like to talk about doing multidisciplinary, but mo the problem with multidisciplinary is that then it is very difficult to assess because it is very difficult to find multidisciplinary experts. Uh, I know one thing, one part of the problem, not the other part of the problem. So it is very difficult for me to assess the problem in a complete way. But well, and, and try to assess the real value of the things. It's difficult for me to assess the real value of the experiments. I can imagine that they are very, very difficult, but it is difficult for me to assess. So in this case, it is difficult the other way around. So um, let me just use water as one of the, this is one of the things that we do. So this is a dam break example. So it is water just going against this wall. So it's, water is very nice because with water we can, we can do kind of some analogies. So like water, what we have to do is try to, to solute on ourselves the, um, all the knowledge that it is coming from the different fields. Um, so it's really, the, in, in that respect, it's really a multidisciplinary. A certain Leonardo did it some time ago, um, which was kind of a successful guy. So it is like coming back. This multidisciplinary stuff is like coming back. So like water also, um, what we have to then, once you have absorbed all this knowledge and you have accepted uh, the things that you don't know, you try then to, with this multidisciplinary study, you try then to understand the, the um, deep, um, the deep meaning of, of nature and the things that, that you are doing. So it is, uh, well, it is, yesterday, um, Blanca said many times, it is, you have to be, and, and even in informal talks about the, the, uh, that you have to be patient and, and humble, but in any case, strength, you have to perseverate. So it is like water, I would like to finish this with this. Um, sometime you have, maybe you have seen this, it's very nice, just go to internet, put be water, my friend, and you will see uh, Bruce Lee talking about water. Uh, so I think that this is, yes, this is all. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for this talk. Maybe partially some, some, some practical questions. Is first you say that you use your own code hmm. for solving this. Hmm. What's the main reason why you had to develop your code? Because there's plenty of multi-physics code around in the world. Why did you yes. make again another one? Yes, because the, um, the 
we've been talking about a, a bit of, of this yesterday, is that in our case, the, 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 the path that we followed from the very beginning was not that, for instance, I, am, I do fluid mechanics, I would like to use or write a code. It was different. It was, our background was in multi-physics, in computational mechanics, and we've been working in different codes. We've been developing different codes uh, for doing fluid mechanics and solid mechanics, and we said, oh, we can do a code that it is multi-physics and that it is uh, efficient for running in supercomputers. Um, in the same way as it is efficient for running in one, uh, with one problem, it's a, it should be efficient for running in several problems. So this is the differential things, the differential thing of uh, most of the codes uh, that, are, that, that are around. There is no commercial code that can solve efficiently in hundreds, in hundred thousand, of course, a multi-physics problem. So that was a very nice, um, a very nice field to, to work on because th this means not just program, but this means that you have to study a lot about different aspects of the full computational mechanics problem, like starting from the algorithms, the very algorithms, because it gives you a different perspective. So you study different algorithms, you study plenty of different computational issues like programming parallel, when you're solving in parallel two different codes, two different problems, how to couple them in an efficient way. So um, if you look from the, with some perspective, you see, well, it is an, another, another group of guys doing this. But if you look more carefully, you say, ah, well, but there are some uh, things that are different, which means that we, we are not very smart guys, but um, uh, it's, uh, the good point is that we work in a supercomputing center, so they pay, for doing, they pay us for doing that. And if you, if you look, that there are plenty of work for everyone. There are plenty of things to be done still. And, and partially related to that is, do you develop your code differently knowing that you work in a supercomputer and that it will run on a supercomputer, or totally independently and you say, like, I just find the best way of doing the multi-physics? Yes, this, this, is, this is a very nice question. Because um, right now it's not that much, but some years ago people talk about parallelizing a code. So you get a sequential code and then you say, oh, we have parallel machines here. Uh, let's parallelize this code. And you study how to parallelize it. But in, if you want to use uh, 100,000 cores, not 100, just hundreds of cores, if you do this strategy, it's not very, it's, you are not going to go very far. So what you have to do really is to start from the, from the very beginning thinking that you have a parallel code. So you don't write a sequential code and then parallelize it. You write the parallel code. So this uh, puts you in a different perspective. And everything you see, you, you do, and you program on the algorithms you try to develop are related to this. So it is um, in this way, it kind of conditionates a lot the kind of algorithms that you're going to develop. And then also when you do this, it's like you have different architectures for supercomputers and they're changing over time. Yes. How yes. dependent is your code or how dependent or how much do you need to think about the architecture rather again than on the physics problem? Yes, this is, this is another beautiful question. Is that uh, as, as we work in a supercomputing center, we can have a better idea on, a better idea ahead, the kind of architectures that are coming. So what we try to do is we try to write the code. This code must be used by people that have no uh, clue on how to parallelize things. But we, will, we like that people use the code and program things there in a way that, that parallelization, let's say, is kind of transparent. So if you do things that are very, very target, targeted to one architecture to run very, very efficiently one architecture, dangers are everywhere because maybe the architectures that do not depend on me. Architectures depend on IBM, Intel engineers, um, NVIDIA engineers. So they are going to come up with a new architecture and give, give it to you and say, well, this, this is the new architecture and you have to program everything all over again. And the second thing is about the flexibility of the code. So what, you, what, you, what we do is we try to do things in a way that the code is flexible, that it can be, um, programmed by people with no, uh, almost no knowledge on parallelization. But it can, but on the other hand, we have plenty of um, researchers working with us that are mostly devoted to uh, do the deep, low level computational things of the code in order to make it flexible. And then coming to the code, 
what's your opinion on, on for example, open source codes and, and like group coding mm. and this kind of things to really get into it? Oh, it's it's okay. I think we have with with my friend that are the 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 other leader of of the group. We always say that okay, it's a joke, but with part of of truth is that you have to program everything, because when you program, you understand. Okay, you can say, Oof, but you need plenty of time and resources to do. Okay, fine. But it is if you think about this as the as the last idea. It's very good because with that you can start your own coding. Um, there are plenty of codes everywhere for doing plenty of things open source. So you are sometimes researchers are tempted to say, why should they program this if there are so many codes there? Try it. It's good to try this. And right now you have MATLAB and you have this kind of um, Mathematica. You have these kind of tools where you can do your own little little things there, and, and even you can grow uh, larger. And then you can come. You, then you can use an, uh, other people's codes. And especially the good point of open source is that you can see what they do because the commercial code sometimes you don't know what they do. So you get the results, and well, these results are okay because everyone uses this, this uh, ANSYS or Abacus. Everyone uses Abacus. Then Abacus is is correct. No, you don't know what is inside. So. Well. Well, thank you, Mariano, for this brilliant talk. Uh, indeed, this question a little bit related to, the, to, to this. Uh, you, you didn't comment anything about uh, the verification and the possible need of, of code hmm. certification, hmm. especially when you're simulating like strong couplings where you need to have your own solvers. Hmm. And uh, so, but not only the processing code, but also the post-processing and, and visualization where you have quite quick yes. comment on that, please. Yes, yes, yes. Um, as we, if, if you solve very a hard beating, things like that, the, the validation on a, on a case with a hard beating is, is relatively um, loose because the, it's kind of indirect. But in order to reach, to do, to perform these simulations, first of all, you have to pass plenty of these validation stuff. Uh, now real validation because it is like uh, you solve um, simpler problems, academic simple problems, and try to uh, repeat either experimental results when they are for simple problems. You try to repeat. Um, um, there is a way of doing this kind of thing that is called manufacture sol solutions. That you do this. Uh, you you say this is the problem I want to solve. This is the solution I would like to uh, to attain. So you program this in your code and and you see that you have and you see that you attain this solution. Then there are other. Uh, things that you can do is that to compare with uh, other codes that are around. And there are, for instance, um, in electrophysiology, it was a paper done by, by people from King's College that they do. They propose a relatively simple test and say, well, everyone to solve this test and try to, and there, there were plenty of differences for everyone, but then try to explain these differences. So the, what, I, what I would like to, to to come up to is that if you want to, to assess uh, fluid mechanics, for instance, turbulence or fluid mechanics, you have some very um, well-established way of validating. But with biological stuff, like biomedical simulations, the way of validating is, uh, the process of validating uh, is more complex. I don't see that it is different. I wouldn't say that it is not possible, but it is different. And we try to do our best for doing this kind of thing. So let's say at low level, it's relatively validated and validated every time. So at higher level, it's more complex, but we try. Hmm. Other questions? Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. It's a general question on computational fluid dynamics, but specifically re uh, related to the particle tracking on turbulent hmm. flow. I would like to know your opinion comparing traditional uh, approaches like solving the Navier-Stokes conservation equations or Lattice-Boltzmann. Yes, um, well, the La Lattice-Boltzmann is a, uh, um, it's, it's very good, I mean, this is a personal opinion. Lattice-Boltzmann is fantastic for microfluidics, for things that are really small. Um, I, we, we, didn't, we don't have in the code Lattice-Boltzmann so we use now traditional, more traditional Navier-Stokes. 
The fact is that we prefer Navier stocks for that's because our training comes from that, but also because uh, in Navier stocks, the Navier stocks equations are solid, are rock solid. There is something that is there, and you are absolutely sure that what you are solving is within the ranges, within the range, application range of Navier stocks. Um, people would say Boltzmann equation is rock solid too. Fine. It's rock solid too for um, at a very, very lower level, a much, much lower level. So in the ranges that they that people use in general, lattice Boltzmann, well, lattice comes from the discretization of the Boltzmann equation, and it is a particular discretization. So at the, at the range that people use right now, lattice Boltzmann, there are plenty of examples that they work well, and they give, and you can have good results on that. Um, but sometimes, to me, it's a bit difficult to understand. I cannot follow all the steps because the, the, some dark point and obscure point. Uh, on the other hand, with the Navier Stokes uh, based code, even if it is finite differences, finite volumes, finite elements, spectral methods, whatever, uh, it's easier to follow. You can rewrite and reprogram everything and getting the same results with no uh, strange constant put there, here and there. But this is a very personal opinion. But uh, in my opinion, for microfluidics, Lattice Boltzmann is very good. Hmm. This is to say, the higher the Reynolds, the better is the use of Navier stocks, even if you have, can have very nice results with Lattice Boltzmann. I, I wouldn't say that. Thanks for the great talk. I had just a, a question or a comment, because you present like a causality that, okay, the physiology model is okay, and then I do all my simulations, but I would rather say, is this physiological model okay for the question I want to look at? And in the end, you are in the unique position to look at all exactly. these integrated results yes, yes, yes. and go back to the model and maybe yes, simplify yes, exactly, it. And, exactly. uh, yes, exactly, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. I, I did this uh, simplified idea, but it, it is exactly as you said, is, um, is that like, I have some hypotheses. So under this hypothesis, I program. So I do the model. I then start to, the, to do this validation and to try these different problems. And then with that, I can, I can come up with. Ah. Let us suppose that you, you are the guy that developed the physiological models. Then you, come, you, come to me, you can come to me and say, well, now run these cases to see which are the things that I have to correct or modify my physiological model. So in this sense, it is a very, it's very rewarding because we can work a lot with, peop with people that develop the physiological models. So it, yes, it is exactly as you said. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, so thank you again, uh, Mariano.